Hey, this is Ev. Thank you for tuning to The Entrepreneur Next Door. And so this is a podcast about entrepreneurship. And uh, in, in more cases than not, entrepreneurship is, is really about a choice. And most of the time, the choice involves a considerable amount of risk. And in many cases that we're familiar with and read about and hear about, um, the risk very often comes with a cause. So we all came across, we know the Simon Simon Sinek, the why. Uh, people like to do business with you, not because of what you do, by why you do what you do. And so um, there are lots of entrepreneurial stories that start with, I used to call them sob stories. You know, I lived in a car, I didn't have anything. And all of a sudden I had this magical brain thing and the rest is history i now live in a mansion and drive fancy cars so this is not going to be the story today <laughs> um and uh, i am very very excited to welcome awit walter gabriel to my podcast awit you have an amazing story i want to spend time uncovering your story and what you do but i'll Shut up for one minute and let you introduce yourself first. Well, thank you so much for having me first and foremost. And uh, thanks to all your listeners uh, from giving me a chance to tell my story. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Awit Wolde Gabriel. I'm the founder and creative director of Awit New York, a uh, luxury livewear line uh, based in New York City, founded in 2020. Okay, so I always kind of start my podcast the same way. We'll we'll speed this up because I want to spend more time on what you do in your cause and some some other interesting topics I want to cover. Um, so you were born in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me a little bit about your childhood. Um, there was at some point there was a war, and you got you guys got relocated to refugee camps, but talk about when you were a teenager growing up in Ethiopia, what type of life was it? What type of aspirations do you have back then? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think relatively, I would say we had a, such a beautiful childhood. My father had moved from Eritrea where he was, you know, a village kid that lived in a stone hut, no electricity, out in the mountains, basically. And he knew that's just not the life that he wanted. So he ran away to Ethiopia, which at that time was just this bustling city. It was the Mecca for what Africa could look like. Um, and so he went there. And the only thing, the only skill he had was becoming a tailor. That's something that he saw his mother do, fixing all the clothes for him and his 13 siblings. Uh, and so he said, oh, I can mend clothes. I can, I can fix clothes of businessmen as they're going around to offices and what have you. Um, and he made a career out of it, you know, and started hiring other uh, uh, tailors and then started opening up a shop, then started importing goods, started importing fabrics, and then made, um, you know, what he was a, a really successful businessman in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So he made a life for himself. He made a life for us. Um, and that was my lifestyle. That was my life there, there in Ethiopia. We had a great life. We, um, you know, we had holidays. Right now, we just did the Orthodox Easter just past uh, this past Saturday. So we're, we, were, we were raised Orthodox. And I just remember holidays, you know, we would, we would get the best uh, lamb and the best beef. And you would get everyone in the neighborhood to come around. The gates would be open. And we would have anyone that would that was hungry would be welcomed. And so that was the childhood that I lived in. And I cherish that little moment that I had. Um, and, you know, that all kind of came crashing down when the war between Eritrea, our original country, and Ethiopia, our host country, as I like to call it, even though I was born there, in our region, it's not about where you were born, it's where your parents, direct parents are from, that dictates mm -hmm. where you're from. So we were always, we always knew we were Eritreans living abroad in Ethiopia. And so when the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia started in 1998, you know, everything my father had worked for vanished in a second, you know, um, from living in a beautiful place with a gated community, everything. It was just like, 
a, just a life that you would never want to leave um, to now being rounded up in buses um, because of your, your ethnicity. Um, and we were taken to buses and dropped off in the desert between Eritrea and Ethiopia. And that started my two-year journey as a refugee from 1998 to 2000, living in camps between Eritrea, Ethiopian desert to uh, Kenya. Um, and so that, that, so from a beautiful childhood, having had access to everything, to learn anything, to just be, just be a kid, right? To then now transitioning into this um, unknown of being a refugee, only having one thing in our armor, which is hoping that it will get better. Um, and that's, that's kind of how I summarize what childhood looked like. So uh, how old were you when the two years you were in a refugee camp? So from eight to 10. Wow. Yeah. Those are, I think, some of the most pivotal times when you're trying to figure out what the, what the world is like, you know? Um, and at that moment, I say like, I have really, I had already seen the best of the world from, you know, before then to, to the worst of the world, to seeing kind of people dying, people getting killed, just purely out of ethnicity. Um, and it changed the way I saw the world. You saw it very, you know, you, you don't usually get the extremes in life. You, mm -hmm. you have hardships, we all do, but you don't see the extremes. You read about it, you watch a movie about it, but, you know, you, you rarely kind of see the extremes of what human humans are capable of doing to each other um, yeah and both, and uh, i and i think in your case because we all live in america and we are i think we are as americans even though i'm like you i'm originally from a different country that went through wars mm -hmm. we're really desensitized to all these experiences because they are there are things we see on cnn or whatever channel um the pictures can be can be emotionally uh devastating to watch but then as soon as that segment is done it's followed by a commercial for a lexus or a vacation <laughs> or something else yeah so you could say oh well we're lucky it didn't happen to us but i think and and i'll talk about this particular uh our the concept of Sometimes our, we we are not able to truly connect with someone else's experience mm -hmm. for different reasons. In this mm -hmm. case, it's because we watch it on CNN. Oh my God, I feel so bad for these people in refugee camps. Mm -hmm. And then the next commercial is about some, buying something on sale, so we should go buy it, right? It just yeah. it goes like that. Mm -hmm. The other piece that I'm as as a a preview to what I want to talk to you about is also the whole issue about race about about black versus white which again as, as a white guy and and i'll preview what i'm going to talk to you about later um i had really really close friends who were uh and i'm going to use the word black although i know it's it's more pc to say african-american mm -hmm. but i say it because because it's okay because it's it's i say it with love and appreciation right sure. um and, and we had some really deep conversations about about racism about the black and the white thing and i remember saying to them look i can relate to some parts of it but i don't understand what it's like to have different color skin and people view you differently mm -hmm. right and and I'll, I'll jump into that after you get to atlanta but go back to to your days in a refugee camp how did your father how was he able to keep everybody together i mean really coming from losing everything and winding up in a hut with no electricity for two years and having a family. How did he deal yeah. with that? Yeah, I think, so this is the, you know, uh, my father right before the war had started, I think like four months before the war started, he had moved to uh, Atlanta for business. Um, and so, and then while he was there was when the war started. And so he couldn't come back. Um, and so it was me, my sister, Rahel, uh, Luan's sister, Samri's sister, and Alex. So five of us were the ones left over 
the rest were in Europe for school. He had sent another daughter for the school here. So he, you could see that he had means to be able to send his kids to, the, to, to where he need, they needed to go. So it was so unexpected. So he had left for a business meeting and now he had kids under 16, five of them at home. And when the soldiers came, they basically told my 16 year old, hey, you have three days to sell everything your father had made because we're putting you in a bus, you mm -hmm. know? And so I think that that was when she then became an adult, you know, and her child was taken in a way that was not for me um, in a different way. And um, so for him, he had two years of fighting to get us to Atlanta. You know, that's all he could do because he couldn't go back. He, there was no more connections that would help. It was a state of war between the two countries. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, access couldn't be gained anymore. It was, um, it was, you are Eritrean, you are put in a bus, you are killed. Your sons are going to jail because they post threats if they're over 16. I mean, it was a kind of dystopian experience, you know, and, but it was also what war looked like. You know, I saw at the age of eight, a person get killed right in front of me. And that just changed how I looked at life um, and the fragility of life too, because it was in a second it's really in a second that we are, we think we're so mighty, but in a second, done, yeah. you know, and it's, it's insane. So I think that's when all of us looked at the world a little differently than we um, had seen it before. Yeah. So I, I didn't realize that you were separated from your dad when this happened mm -hmm. and this poor guy's got his kids locked up in a refugee camp and, and, I think the worst thing I can imagine is is the feeling of helplessness, right? Uh, yeah. You have to go through the channels and only do There's what you can do. do, right? There's yeah. nothing you can do. You know, so, he he lobbied the State Department. He did a lot of things, and I had, at that point, I also had a brother. He had sent over to the U.S. for school that was helping him figure out the system. And it was never in our plans to come to the U.S. We had a great life. Um, mm -hmm. and here we are, you know, now, you know, and that's the, that's the crazy thing about a lot of refugees is that they don't come seeking, they come because they have to, Yeah, you know? So. Well, so, so story ends on a good note. He manages to get you to the U S you guys go to Atlanta. Um, and so, so you're about, what about 11 when you came here? Yeah. And a 10 going on 11. Okay. So we'll, we'll we'll speed up through. You grew up in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So was he? Did he have a business then? Well, he couldn't go back. So what did he do then? Yeah. So when we got to Atlanta, there was one thing we all had to do: rebuild, 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 rebuild. Um, and you know, I think those two years that he was away from us, my father, who's you know a very for when I walked around with him in, in Atlanta, people thought he was my grandfather. So. He, he, I was one of those, the last kids that he shouldn't have had, you know, uh, at his age, his age and he had deteriorated, you know, this like robust, active, amazing businessman that I knew growing up had really, you know, those two years really did a number on him. And he wasn't a man that, you know, could, could rebuild in this country that he had no idea about, you know? Um, and I think that he found it really hard, but he challenged us. He said, you know, rebuild the life that we had, you know, uh, honor what we've done, what I've done back home. Um, I've gotten you here. Uh, and I think, you know, for him, it, it was, he was happy that we were there and challenged us to do mm -hmm. what we needed to do, because I don't think he had the stamina, um, you know, but also just... I think he was also just, you know, your whole life that you had built from, you know, he was a child that, of farmers, you know, from a hut in the highlands of, a, of the Eritrea that made it in Africa, you know, and, and it was all gone. And I think that, 
you know, part of it, I think he was a little bit broken, you know, um, uh, broken and also just mm -hmm. age wise, it was just he couldn't redo what he did before. But he challenged us and he said, I got you here. It's time for you to take the helm of the life that you want to live. And so we took that and we went with it, all of us individually in our own ways. But but Awit, you you were not speaking English when you came here, right? No. So so you're at eleven with your brothers and sisters. You show up in in Atlanta, mm -hmm. but you don't speak English. Zero. I knew the ABC songs, and I had <laughs> okay. watched like Home Alone and all the TVs, but we didn't really know what they were saying. We just thought it was funny. Yeah. Um, and so uh, yeah. And you have to go to school, but you have to go to school, but you have to study. You have to learn English first. I right? learned English. I went to ESL class, um, which is the English first first uh, first language. Um, took me a long time to learn English. I read everything that I could read. I read. I started with the easiest ones, which was Dr. Seuss books. Um, I had a, a hard, very difficult time with reading and reading comprehension. Um, they put me in special ed class um, until I was a freshman year in high school. Um, you know, and I don't know if you know about the special ed program that ranges from everyone that has special needs to someone who has difficulty reading. Um, and it was when I, I just knew that I needed to learn. I just knew mm. that for me at that time, education was the way to rebuild what I had, what my father had done. Um, and I knew that that was going to open doors that nothing else could open. Um, mm. Whereas other siblings then found entrepreneurship quicker than I did. Um, and then they were able to open shops, open liquor stores, open tax offices, open all these incredible businesses that uh, restaurants that were doing well. And for me, um, as the youngest, I really leaned in on education as the way to to open the world for me. and And from your your history you do you do pretty well you're a smart kid you wind up in high school mm -hmm. you you want to take some ap classes so clearly you're self-driven motivated mm -hmm. more um and one of the things that that uh, maybe it shouldn't have shocked me but you said when you went to your teachers and you said i want to take ap classes um you're you were discouraged from taking it your department head or whoever the person was said um you couldn't handle it it wasn't yeah. for you right yeah. yeah uh and and I, I, I correct me if i'm wrong but i think that the way that you creatively address that by i think you invented an advocate for yourself right you made up a gmail address yeah <laughs> Right. So where, where are you getting this information? <laughs> I mean, I, I thought that was one of the I mean, this is something that people like us who are foreigners yeah. who are in the US, you know, you know, if you just go up against bureaucracy, you're just gonna have to be creative, right? You have to, creative. You have to do it, right? So yeah. you, so I'm I'm just gonna tell everybody. So your teachers told you you're not smart enough or it'd be too much for you to take AP classes. And so you create a, an email address, a Gmail address for somebody who is going to be your advocate. And that person was emailing your school, telling them <laughs> that, no, this guy is capable of taking it. I highly encourage you. Let him do this, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is, first of all, I don't know where you found that information. I told so, you, I spent hours through everything uh, I've I found about you. I don't even know the last time I told that story, but it's funny. I, I don't, I'm really shocked you found that information, but um, I love it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I created a a, a family lawyer because we had no parents. My father, um, he chose he chose to go back to Eritrea, his homeland, mm -hmm. for his last days. And um, I, we had no mother growing up, and so we were raised by our father. And so I was like, I have no advocate. I have siblings that are doing their thing, trying to rebuild their lives. I'm the youngest. I have no one advocating for me. I got out of ESOL class, which is the English learning for first. Now they put me in, in special ed and I'm looking around. I'm like, I should be, I, I'm working hard. I shouldn't be in special ed. And the first time that I used our family lawyer, quote unquote, I mean, and the alias I created, it was Deborah Lube. 
Um, and I just thought that was such a bland white woman name that no one would ever question, you know? <laughs> I was like, you know, they're not going to question Deborah Lee. Who, who would question her um, as the family lawyer? And I, you know, channeled like my inner white woman, you know, I was like, dear blah, 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 <laughs> and demanded whatever I wanted uh, for this person I was legally guardian for or the family representative for and the reason that that also helped was that there was also this mystery about oh you don't have your parents here oh you had a good life in Ethiopia who is this person so they had this idea that oh maybe you know he does have an, a family lawyer maybe it is that kind of family because no one could figure figure us out you know, because um, my siblings were working hard, we were progressing in life, we were at the best schools and in high school and in the best neighborhood. And so they, were, they couldn't figure out like, okay, maybe it is true that it could have like a family lawyer. So no one questioned it. But when I tried to get, I got out of special ed and now I was like in honors and I was like, okay, honors is great, but I wanna go to AP. I wanna be a head start of college. As I said, education, I knew I would take it. And I got such, from the AP science teacher, her head, the department head, she was like, no, you can't do it. You won't be able to handle it. You had special ed, you only have odd honors. And so I said, you know what? Deborah is gonna email you. And so Deborah emailed her, emailed the guidance counselor, emailed all of my teachers and set up a meeting uh, for everyone to meet, to talk. Because I had advocates, in school, I had my honors teachers advocating my, everyone was advocating for me, except this one department head that had to clear it out, that had to basically sign off. And I knew if I can get them all in one room, that the advocates would overpower her. And, and just pure pressure, she'll be able to say but, but, yes. But the lawyer couldn't attend because she was fictitious. The lawyer couldn't attend and she made a last minute I can't attend, but please let me know what you all decide. <laughs> and so I went in and they said, you know, I talked to Deborah. She couldn't make it. And everybody just said, oh, well, you know, busy lawyer, hotshot Atlanta lawyer, you know. Um, and it was it was kind of just like. I realized that there, if, when you don't have an advocate, you have to be creative and you have to make things happen. And and she couldn't attend, but she succeeded because I got into the AP class um, because in that room there were five people that were advocates for me and there was one department head saying that I couldn't and so she never had been she had never experienced me in the class or anything and and so I also learned the power at that moment of community and the power of like having advocates in whatever you're doing making sure that you have more people rooting for you and making sure they know who you are um, in a room that you're sometimes not even in yeah. or that your lawyer can be in for. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I, I always like to take like a brief time out to, to explain to the people that listen and gonna watch this maybe on YouTube is that uh, we're talking about a 10 year old kid separated from his dad, put in a refugee camp for two years, takes time, winds up in Atlanta, not speaking English, um, have to start a new life, goes to high school, struggles with English, becomes special ed, overcomes that, becomes, goes to honors classes, and then the school system looking at your history says, well, AP is not for you because you were special ed one day, which is absolutely insanely stupid because they did not understand the whole person, mm -hmm. right? If they said, oh, but he came from a different country, he didn't speak English, maybe that's why he was special ed. But mm -hmm. the teacher said he can do it. So we'll fast forward, you wind up going to college for what? I went to college or went to university for international relations. Um, it was a private liberal arts school in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and, uh, and then I then started my career at the Coca-Cola company. I was their youngest employee at 19 at the corporate mm -hmm. level. Um, so end of freshman year, going into sophomore year, I started as a corporate employee and started taking classes at night and then corporate America during the day. Wow. Perfect. Um, I did the same thing. Went, worked full time and went to college full time. 
uh, which not many people do, but that's what we do. If you want to rebuild, you got to do, right? do it. You got to do what you got to do. You have to do it. Yeah. So I'm going to jump again because I have a lot more of the stuff I want yeah, to talk yeah. to. So you wind up in, of all places, you go to NYU and you you have two MBAs, one from Stern School of Business, right? Yeah. And so I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So I did an MPA, which is Master's in Public Administration. And then I did an emphasis on an MPA, an, an MBA from Stern, uh, Stern courses. And so it was kind of a combination. Um, and really the focus was on production, production um, uh, capabilities, how to make sure factory owner. This is also, mind you, I didn't have an idea that I was gonna ever be in fashion but it was right. with I was working full time again but I also knew I just wanted to get this master's degree and so I was like let me focus on you know production and productivity that was the one that was laid out as like an option for a thesis and I was like oh that sounds fun you know why not let's learn about production the manufacturing cycle how to uh, assess like factories like um, humane treatment of workers and let's let's create something you know and it was primarily with Indian factories and everything and so that's what I focused on um at NYU and and so with your MBAs when did you so you got a job with the UN uh working on UNICEF right yes uh and UNICEF you you tell me but I believe that has to do with children yes yeah so UNICEF um prime, so it works it, holistically with children, um, children and mothers mostly, but um, it's really the only organization, you know, we, we must have, um, vaccinates 40% of the world's children, but also has this kind of supply chain of getting um, all vaccinations to anywhere, everywhere. And so many, I mean, it's an incredible supply chain system that they have. Um, mm -hmm. Next to UNICEF, actually, Coca-Cola has the most uh, advanced supply chain system uh, of how to get products to uh, hmm. to the world. So sometimes those two places, those two organizations work together to say, oh, you know what? We can't get this vaccine in this village, but Coca-Cola has figured out how to get Coca-Cola in that Coke. village. Maybe we can work with them and vice versa, you know? So it's, 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 it's kind of funny that those two places that I've I've called career spots for myself, hot spots for myself. Um, uh, it's kind of funny, Howard, because I'm, yeah. as you're talking, I'm, I think the movie was called, this is a long time ago, The The Gods Must Be Crazy. I don't know if mm -hmm. you've ever seen that, but it's mm -hmm. uh, it, it's an African, no place, you know, a bunch of natives walking around and all of a sudden they hear noise and they look up and I think there's a plane and the next thing, a Coke bottle falls on, just lands in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the rest of the movie, but I remember this scene because I think it's the starting scene. So um, you work for the UN, you, you started with Coke, you got your MBAs, um, then the pandemic hits and it, I, I guess, rattles you up in a different way, right? So you mm -hmm. you were at a 10 year old, you got dislocated into a refugee camp. Then the next step is you get to the US, not speaking English, got to rebuild. Mm -hmm. um, the pandemic did something to you, right? Which kind of changed the trajectory of your career and your future. So let's talk about that. What happened? Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it is that it really completely changed and put everything upside down. Um, pandemic hit, and I think we all had this time to think, finally, right? We had not been thinking for so long because we've been going and going and going. And in my case, I've just been so focused on rebuilding, making my father proud, making his legacy good. And I've been so focused on that. And it, it was the reason why I was driven. And it was the reason why I think I accomplished a lot of things that I did at a young age was because I had that in the back of my head. The pandemic hit and I stopped and I started thinking again about my core, which is the values that my father had taught me and about him. And I said, how are people like my father, Taylor's, doing at this time? Here I was at that time, I was I was hunkered down in um, Martha's Vineyard. 
Um, not a bad place to be during the pandemic. Uh, I had a great job that was giving me every two weeks great pay, you know, working with huge partnerships to bring at that time the COVAC relief efforts for, for UNICEF. Um, it was like a $6 billion um, effort that I was like working with my team to lead. So I had a great job, great pay in a beautiful island. Pandemic is hitting. And I was like, how are tailors like my father doing? Because they can't work from home. They can't take their their clients with them on a, on a Zoom call. You know, how are people like my father, the way that he was when he first started his life in Ethiopia, how are they doing that? Um, and so I started contacting, I, I Googled like garment houses in New York City. Again, no fashion industry, no idea about the fashion world um, other than what we all know just from TV and everything. And I Googled and one of them answered and it was a company called Apparel Productions. And it was a third generation Greek owned family that has, it's on 38th Street that has had it from their grandmother. Um, and they and I said, how are you doing? They said, we're about to let everybody go. We have 41 people. There's no way that, you know, we can keep it open because no one's doing orders. The brands can't afford to do orders. There are no buyers and stores are not buying. So the brands can't do it. And so the whole ecosystem of what the fashion industry represented was falling apart. You know, those are the people that sold the buttons. That's a whole store right there, family owned store. The zippers, the manufacturers of fabric, the, the people who bring in the fact, the, the deliver the uh, fabrics. There's a whole supply chain of people that were all being affected and no one could do anything about it. And so, you know, it wasn't, I didn't see it. Was, you know, people say like, I, I, I saw a problem and I solved it. I saw an opportunity to do what was right and I went with it. So I didn't start a business. I saw an opportunity to do what was right. And I said, okay, cool, I'll start a brand. Um, I'll call it First Collections, I promise to New York, 100% will go to you and uh, let's see what happens. And then, and I channeled my, and this is when I started seeing the puzzles of my whole career come, come together. At Coca-Cola, we always talked about like when we were trying to acquire a brand, it's like, what was the market telling us? What does the market need? And at that time, I was like, what, am, what if I'm going to start a brand, if this is a brand, what is the market all about? And the market was about hoodies, joggers, and a hat maybe, you know, with your mask. And so I said, okay, let's make the best hoodie that we could ever think of. We looked at 17 of the best hoodies from Bottega Veneta to Gap, you know, cut them apart, looked at the seams and everything, and actually created a 13-page dossier on how we created the best hoodie out there with silk sheen, regenerated poly, and really just honed in on my brand skills from Coca-Cola about what it takes to have a brand, um, and went all in and created the G-District hoodie and G-District joggers. And so after we created it, this was two months after I made that promise, right? So everything's moving fast. Um, and we, I emailed everyone that I had ever met. And I said, I'm starting this initiative. It's going to be $450 for a hoodie, $350 for a jogger, and $180 for a hat. I know this is very steep for a new brand, but it's 100% going to the garmenters, and I'm going to open a pop-up on November 24, 22nd, 2020. And we'll have, we'll check your temperature and everything. I hope you can make it. The line was around the corner. So again, um, you know, circle back to what we're talking about. Um, Awit has a great job during the pandemic realized that the garment industry is disrupted to the point of kind of like restaurants, right? They went mm -hmm. silent, zero, done, nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you decide to start your own brand in order to employ people who are completely this, this got dislocated from everything because yeah. of COVID. So you're going to, okay, no one else is buying. Well, I'm going to start my own brand 
and keep them busy and give them a way to uh, support themselves. Um, I found a, I'm scrolling through my endless notes here, uh, something your dad told you when you were young. He said, always look out for people with greatness in their hands, right? Mm -hmm. that, was, that was your dad thing. Yep. That was what he imparted on you. So you start a brand uh, after researching, yeah, so hoodies is was the in thing. Uh, you differentiating <clears throat> the hoodie, making it, uh, I'm going to just go to what what's like the, the bullet points of of the hoodie, right? Mm -hmm. Casual gender neutral streetwear, 50% regenerated polyester and 50% cotton with silk sheen on top and inside super soft fleece. Made in America, sustainable fabric, local New York garment production. Mm -hmm. That was that was your thing, right? Yep. And you know, being a smart guy and a marketing guy, so like the world does not need another hoodie. But if we're going to do another hoodie, it needs to be high end, but justify the price, right? Yeah, yep, yep. And, you know, the thing is, like, I knew people were going to support the cause. But I didn't want them to support the cause and not have a product they were so, so proud of having as well, you know. And we wanted to create a piece that, you know, it, it's it's kind of like our signature piece. People love it. People, you know, again, like you said, it world doesn't need another hoodie, and they also don't need another fashion line. But what they do need, what we all need, is a way to connect with each other to be a part of something bigger. Um, and I think that when I launched, that's what people had an opportunity to do. Oh, they had an opportunity to really be a part of something bigger, but have pieces they are so proud to wear, not just mm -hmm. because it's just like a feel good thing. I didn't want a feel good thing. I wanted a product that represented. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I buy Bomba socks because I like their okay. mission so that they know donate a, a pair to a homeless shelter when you buy their socks. They happen to be good, comfortable socks, but they also manufacture their socks in an, in a way that makes them comfortable because there's no seam with there's no seam where the toes are, mm -hmm. which is the most annoying thing that robs against you. So th there is something unique about them. And in your case, you're right. If I, I look, my the women in my life, being my wife and my daughters, are mm -hmm. classy, you know fashionistas fashionistas um you and i know each other because my amazing future son-in-law kev work uh who introduced me to you thank you so much it's amazing uh he is a fashionista guy too and he always talks about sample stores and uh so you but you use the term that that i want to explain to people who are not in the fashion industry what is a i'm opening a pop-up store pop-up store whatever can you explain what that is yeah, so a pop-up store is when a brand takes over a space that might be vacant or a state that um, a space that um, could be used by another brand as well, and they basically pop in and invite all their supporters to come shop. And so there was a vacant um, spot in Lafayette and um, uh, Kenmere uh, in Soho. That was there it was a brand that had closed because of the pandemic um and i contacted the, the owner of that uh, spot and i said hey you guys are closed it's empty in there i would love to do this this is what i'm trying to figure trying to accomplish this is why i'm doing it i've emailed like hundreds and thousands of people that i've ever met in my life um to come support i'd love to have it and the person was like you can have it for free you know um because it was just there um and so that's a pop-up shop and so we took over that spot and um it was yeah and and so that's how for a brand new company with i'm assuming not a ton of resources mm -hmm. you put whatever you have into manufacturing the hoodies mm -hmm. probably not much left for marketing if you're going to go market a 450 dollar hoodie you need to go big or you do it the smart way in grassroots marketing. You start locally, get people who are supporting the cause who can afford it, buying it, and let them tell their friends, right? Yeah. So let that let that organically grow, at least during the pandemic. So I'll tell you how I did this. Um, so I went 
again, got to be savvy, right? Um, and so I knew we had a great story. I knew we had a great why. I knew we had a great product. So check, check, check on that. I was confident in that. Um, and I also knew I had good people all throughout my life that knew community was a big part of who I was. I just, I, no matter what, I always thought about how, what's the bigger picture? Who am I bringing with me um, in this journey, in this work, in this what have you? And so I knew people would say like, oh, this is very much in line with what he is known for or what he does. Um, uh, it just happened to be fashion. And so for me, I went on Fiverr and I hired somebody that gets emails. And, and I said, I need emails of all writers that you can find that are fashion writers. Uh, and it was like $24.99 or something like that for an email of like a thousand writers. And I emailed I, all of them, like every single one of them. And I, and I emailed them why, why I was doing this. Blah, blah, blah. Obviously, I did not get the attention of like 99% of everyone there. Um, but the New York Post uh, writer, um, Lorena was her name, replied. I was like, oh, I love these kinds of stories. Would love to be the exclusive. And then I was like, okay, that sounds like a great uh, way to launch, you know, get New York Post on board because this is such a New York story. So that's when we got her. And that was purely how she was like, how did you get my email? And I was like, oh, a friend, uh, friend uh, sent it to me and said that, you would love it. And she was like, oh, I would, I do love this kind of story. I'm glad your friend sent it to me. And I was like, good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my friend had a cost $24.99. And, uh, and so that's how we got our first press. They did an exclusive, brought a photographer, went and interviewed the garment houses, talked about the pop-up. Um, and then the rest was me emailing everyone I've ever met. And then it just rippled. And you have to remember, November 2020, or even like before that, September 2020, when I started writing these invitations, people really wanted to see how they could make a difference. You know, we were all hungry to do our part because we were still not in control of our lives. We had no control about how we just saw every day. There was a ticker, if you remember, on the TV of how many people were dying. Mm. Um, there was chaos politically. Um, I mean, it was like, crazy time it was a beautiful time for families to be together but like as a country we were all kind of freaking out and I think that when I emailed and people started forwarding and everything people really 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 wanted to see how they could make a positive impact because they had no control about what was going on in communities anymore you know it was just like a very hard time racial issues we had pandemic we had it was just like a lot and i think mm -hmm. that our brand gave especially new yorkers a lot of new yorkers an ability to really take charge in our community and make a difference in a very very grassroots very impactful way um, and that's i think that like was most the most impressive thing and first 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 customer that, that was in line with her son in tow and a toddler in tow was Meredith Melling, who was a former Vogue editor. And she was the first one with a credit card swiping away, you know, and buying it for all her family members. And she has every color that we've ever come up with now. And that's when I just knew like people wanted to be a part of something that was greater than themselves and fashion has an ability to really invite people to greater conversations you know and the hope is that your products will so represent that greater uh, quality that your conversations are sparking yeah but, uh, but yeah. look uh, i'm a marketing guy i'm not definitely know nothing about fashion i'm not even allowed to dress myself before i go out i need to get approval by you know who um but when you when you think about brands that people wear, um, very often it's it's a it's sort of like an it's statement. So you know, if I'm wearing Gucci, if I'm wearing 
Chanel, you know, it says something, right? Yes, those are high quality luxury brands, mm -hmm. but it's also more about projection, right? Well, yeah. I can afford it. Um, I happen to be a big supporter of Patagonia and I wear all their stuff because I believe in their mission. I, I like what they do. But like you said, if if the stuff that they make doesn't feel good, I'm not going to wear it. It's not about, I'm not going to go spend, overspend, just, so in your case, it's an opportunity to wear something that really feels good, yeah. right? It, I mean, it's, I mean, I watched one of the videos, somebody, one of the reporters, CBS, whatever, was touching it, and and she said, oh my God, it's so soft, and you said to her, that's the reaction that we want, that's why we did this. Mm -hmm. So when when did you get your biggest break with this? Biggest break. Um, so I think the biggest break for us, first of all, then we had basically sold $250,000 worth of hoodies, which is insane. You know, um, biggest break I'd say is that someone was fishing, someone that fished with Kenneth Cole was like, have you heard about this brand? They're making a lot of noise, um, you know, and he's all about how to, how to put philanthropy, good, good, um, you know, um, good business and and commerce together. You know, it's he's it's very much into who he is as a DNA, is that he grows businesses by also focusing on people. And so it was no surprise that he was told about the brand, uh, and he was like, oh wow, I definitely want to meet them. And I think meeting him and bringing him as an advisor um, was our biggest break because then he told. Richard Baker, who is the chairman of Sachs about the brand. Richard goes, love, I love this brand. I love all that they stand for. And then he introduced us to CEO of Sachs. And then the rest is kind of history where we exclusively yeah. launched with Sachs Fifth Avenue. But it all kind of comes really to effect with Kenneth Cole believing in us um, and saying, oh, I want to make sure that others know about what stand for what you are doing and it was it was somebody who was <clears throat> you said fishing with Kenneth Cole one of his fishing buddies mm -hmm. told him and that opened the door for you yeah. so Kenneth Cole says he connected with you because you were committed to two things he he supports sustainability and mental health mm -hmm. Tell me about the mental health part, the sustainability and supporting the government people is one thing. What, what is that? How does that angle play into, into the brand? And by the way, did, yeah. when, when did you change it to Awet as a brand, which I love that, by the way, such a cool name and the, the little apostrophe and the A. Yeah. yeah. Is that... um, what do you mean? When did I change it? So you said when you when you first launched, you launched it as a different company. I forgot the no, name. No, no, no. It was still Awet. I was, it was always out. Out York, Okay, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and I think this it was just, you know, the simplest way to kind of launch it that way. And as you know, we needed to give it a name, it can't be like, you know, yeah. it couldn't just be garment district. It needed to be something sexy. Um, and it was mysterious enough that people would look at it and be like, what is this word? You know, it's, it um, sticks. Yeah, <laughs> it sticks. And so we launched with that. Um, so I think when Kenneth talks about that is that when we initially um, met, um, you know, I was really focused on, you know, all of us were having a very hard time with the pandemic in a different way for each person. Um, but surprisingly, none of us were really talking about those things. Um, and so I was really focused on like how, well, this was one way of talking about one industry and how they were dealing with things. But how are we all doing? You know, when my father said, always look out for people with greatness in their hands. For me, it was how do we make sure that customers understand that they have greatness in their hands, even though they're going through so much during the pandemic. And so I wanted to also have those conversations. So through our social media channels, through our newsletters, through a lot of our communication um, aspects we would just start having conversations with people to get them to start talking about how they were feeling how they were revealing and how are they dealing with the pandemic mm -hmm. and so that was very important to the dna of the brand and we try to focus on that as we were growing um, because people just weren't asking themselves how are they really doing 
they were very much about, oh, the pandemic, oh, it's hard. But it's, it, it was taking a toll on all of us emotionally um, so much. And so I think, you know, we are at a point in the world where mental health is at the forefront finally, you know, and we don't have to be like our, you know, parents that held so much in, you know, we can really make sure that we're really talking about how we're feeling in a situation to be, to be better, to, to move on from any kind yeah. of situation. I mean, you, you're you much younger than me, but you said something interesting that, and I think applies even in my parents' generation, um, our parents, and and I'm sure your dad didn't do that. They didn't speak about their mental state. They yeah. had a role to play, right? They, their role to play was mostly survival, mm -hmm. working, supporting a family. God knows what they went through because they never shared it. It wasn't it wasn't fashionable to share anything. They whatever they dealt with, they dealt with on their own. Yeah. Um, and you kind of you look back and you feel, but I wish they talked about it because it would have been so much easier. Sure. Uh, interesting. So, so you meet Canticle, you wind up in Saks Fifth Avenue, which is where your your line is featured. But that's an exclusive, right? Are you you're not are you you're not allowed to distribute somewhere else? Not you? anymore. So the, we had a one year exclusive. Now we have other retail partners that we'll be announcing uh, in the okay. coming months, which is a, a most exciting part of this journey as well. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> There's another aspect to who you are and and I think that defines you. And that's it's really the topic of of we'll call it racism, right? The the maybe the what you were exposed to in Atlanta is you are one of the few black kids in that school. Is mm -hmm. that true? Right? Yeah. I'm so uh, uh and people tell you, no, you can't handle it. Um and, and again, this is this is a big deal topic in this country for sure, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, you didn't you didn't deal with racism when you're in Ethiopia. Sure. Um, I didn't deal with anti-Semitism when I lived in Israel mm -hmm. because we're all Jews. Then we show up here, and then you're exposed to these things that uh, we, we don't even know what What do you mean you don't like Jews, or what do you mean you don't like black people? I mean, it's like it, it's really different, and and it's sure. I think it's part of your who you are and what drives you. Um, and look, from my perspective as a white person, as long as this country is dominated by white privileged white people, white men, particularly mm -hmm. in government, mm -hmm. um, not much is going to change. Yeah. But uh, as Jews discovered through our own heritage, and and I think one of the things that that I found by coming to a country and going to college, and all of a sudden hanging out with with black students and we start mm -hmm. to talk about our heritage and we say holy crap we have so much in common sure. you know black slavery jews slavery discrimination persecution yeah. very very similar stuff but historically and and i think you represent that the one if you wait and rely on the government or, or forces of nature to fix racism it's never going to happen right yeah. so we, we it has to happen internally from your standpoint and for mine it's through education right mm -hmm. <clears throat> when everybody has an opportunity to rebuild as as you did to regrow re, a rebirth take control over their lives sure that's when this this changes right yeah. I, I know it means a lot to you so um yeah so i think it, you know i think it meant it meant I think 2020 again there's so much happening right so we're starting this plan doing this but also 2020 was a, a time of racial reckoning in this country you know um and a much needed racial reckoning and i think for you said it perfectly you know i would never knew i was black in africa i knew i was an eritrean ethiopian ethnically this or what have you and then you come to this country and then you realize, oh, like you are black. You know, when I spent the, the first time I realized that the disparity of this country was when I was I would just spend my lunch periods in, in the library reading books because I just wanted to be ahead. And they were packing up these like compete like they weren't iPads because iPads weren't around at that time. They were like these 
learning pads or whatever. And they were packing them up, the librarians. And I said, oh, where are you packing them? You know, and they said, oh, we're sending them to a, um, to a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a neighborhood that's not here. And, and I was like, what do you mean? Oh, like, you know, like a downtown neighborhood. You know, we're sending them to a downtown neighborhood because we're getting new ones. And then it clicked on me and I was like, oh my God. So there is in this country, children that are getting less, less advanced products, right? To learn, to be, to maximize their learning. Here we are getting new ones and we're sending it to the downtown, the ghetto, mm -hmm. code word, you know? And that's when I realized, oh, okay. So there is a way that they treat black people and they treat white people, you know? And it was the first time I realized that, oh, I would be a downtown kid if I was there. You know, that's how they, they look at me instead of like part of this, you know? And so it was, it was one of the most wake up call moments for me. Um, and I think in 2020, being in Martha's Vineyard, George Floyd had just been murdered and executed in front of all of our eyes. I had, I knew the responsibility I had to make sure that people in that community that were the movers and shakers, were the ones that CEOs of the businesses, they were the ones that were really could change some of these situations that we were going through on a very grassroots level. And um, at that time, there was this, there was these kneelings that were happening in Martha's Vineyard. Um, and it was started by this woman, Dana nu Nunez, and then uh, followed with Amy Schumer helped her like get more people out there. And they were kneeling for the same amount that it took to kill George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And then they would go home. And the third time I went, I was like, I stopped. And I, I was like, guys, this is 5% of what you need to do. The 95% of it is unpacking why this has happened on your watch, on all of our watch. Why was this acceptable on, on the life and the life that we're living? And so um, I started holding salon conversations and it was two hour salon conversations on Wednesdays and Saturdays um, to really, it was kind of like, um, I take it as like akin to like um, AA where everyone had to admit their role as a white person for what we were living through. Um, and it was emotional, it was confidential, um, and it was very raw and honest. But you had people that in the morning were at MS, on MSNBC business talking about whatever, and then at night really getting emotional about the things they said, the things they didn't say, the actions they took, the actions they didn't take, the things they ignored, mm -hmm. you know, and it was such a, an amazing time because people literally changed their organizations. They changed their way of the, how they managed people. They launched initiatives for their organizations. They launched initiatives for their neighborhoods. Um, they started taking accountability. And I think that the best way to move forward is really having these critical conversations about why we haven't even moved at all. And if we can't have those conversations, then we'll never really move forward. Um, but it takes, it, it takes time. And it also starts with all of us admitting our role in what has happened in this country. Um, I think that's been the most difficult thing that was the most difficult thing at that time was people didn't want to admit that they had a very strong relationship with racism in this country, and they had um, a part in why we were living the life that we were all living in this country. And so it's been a very, that was when I like took charge and just said, you know what, if I'm going to be one of the only Black people in <laughs> Martha's Vineyard, uh, I'm going to make sure that, um, especially in the neighborhood that I was in, because there are neighborhoods that are very much um, but it's, I wanted to make sure that I did my part, um, cause I wasn't in the streets in Brooklyn and New York, like in all the cities protesting, I was in Martha's Vineyard, but I was in Martha's Vineyard with the people that 
could really change the organizations that we know and deal with every day. And I just wanted to make sure that they were held accountable. And um, I just spent a time meeting with 588 people in total um, in these salon conversations um, and talking about their intimate relationship with racism an honest conversation, but also all of it led to actions. Okay, now we have an idea of what you're doing. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And so we never left those conversations without very concrete uh, actions on what was the next steps. Yeah, and uh, look, it's uh, so once again, you're you're the only white, you're the only black kid in a, in a white high school in Atlanta. We yeah. won't let you. We won't let you move forward. You create this virtual lawyer that gets you through, and then you fast forward, and you and and you pick Martha's. It doesn't get whiter than Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> um, yeah, but you pick exactly. that place. But but again, you, you know, you you hold people accountable. Say, look, let's have conversation. So I think, look, as, as as again, as a white man who is as far away from racism and bigotry as you can imagine, I think that what it takes is courage. And humility on the part of people that can make a difference, including in in neighborhoods, right? Yeah. Um, to actually have the courage, the humility to recognize, which something that that maybe we would have hoped would happen out of COVID, mm -hmm. the humility that we're all human and can die at any moment. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. In a hospital, saying goodbye via FaceTime or something like that. That at the end of the day, we really are as fragile as our next door neighbor, whether it be Indian, black, white, whatever color it is. And maybe it's time for us to, it's a wake up call. I don't think it lasted too long. That's my personal opinion. And it does require the grassroots kind of work. Like you said, AA, if they had AA meeting on racism in every town in the US, things will change. Things will change. Yeah. They will change. But it's it's tough all right so um if you just last question before we do a couple rapid ones mm -hmm. howard if you fast forward three years from now where are we where's 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 our as a person where's our as a businessman yeah so this year is actually a monumental year we do our first round fundraiser so up to, up to oh. this moment we have been i've been bootstrapping it you know and i can't believe that incredible work we've been able to do with only three people and one of them is part-time you know um and so we're really excited this year is going to be really a year of new hires hopefully um you know we're launching our fundraiser our, to our, our potential investors in like two weeks um raising two million dollars which is very exciting um, and so this year kind of sets up, sets us up for the next three years, you know, uh, to be projected to like a $10 million business. And so it's going to be a crazy roller coaster three years. It's a lot of great work coming ahead, a lot of expansion coming ahead, internationally expansion, local expansion, um, but also growing the team exponentially to hire the best of the best that have the skill sets that I don't have, but have the vision that um, that I do. Yeah. Um, and so we're in a growth year for the next three years as a brand, um, but I'm an entrepreneur. So as a brand and as a person, it's the same thing. You know, um, nothing changes. What is happening with the brand is what is happening with Awa the person. Um, and what is happening with the business is what is happening with Awa the person. So it's all so intertwined beautifully. Um, but this is the first time in my life that all the great, incredible puzzles of all my career careers are falling into place to bring this business to where it needs to go, which is the best, best thing that I could have ever asked for. So do, do people have an awareness, especially after this podcast, that that... I mean, if you develop a brand on sustainability, uh, you know, everybody's into it today, right? Sustainability is not the way you differentiate. Mm -hmm. But uh, are people associating the Awood brand with the Awood person who wants to make a difference when it comes to racism, for example? So uh, are we going to get all the white celebrities wearing Awood as a, as a statement 
you know that it's time to deal with it or is this is this too much for me to to go for, yeah to, so we're not we're not a cause we're not a cause based business right so okay. our business is a community based business so we started as a community led business making sure that we supported the garment workers we've done that with refugees we've done that with ukraine situation in march we've done that with the NAACP and national urban league we've done that with hosting uh, pop-ups for small brands um and so the thing that people wear out for is our commitment to communities period um so we're not one brand um, so adjacent and the best part is that we can genuinely say we support all these these initiatives genuinely and not because it's a csr corporate social responsibility thing mm -hmm. because you just have to go back to our dna why did we start because of community why wouldn't we continue and double down on community and so our effort is to make sure that we support as many initiatives as possible while scaling and being responsible and making sure that we're growing a business. And at the end of the day, we're in the business of making money and making sure that we have a profitable business, but in the end, but also not forgetting why we started. We started for people, our designs are people, the design fabric is community, and the clothes is what makes all that shine. So when people wear our clothing, they know that they're wearing something bigger than just clothing. They're part of something bigger, a bigger community that cares about the world, cares about each other, cares about how we're moving around in this world and what the impact we're having. So I think for us, it's just making sure that you know the customer continues to be that kind of a customer um and i think that's where we're where that's that's our that's our um really like our biggest flex our biggest skill um is that people understand why we started and why we continue and we just have to continually you know not, never forget that as a brand yeah yeah so i i will end by saying that the name awit in ethiopian means victory Yes, right. It means victory. And, yes, and and so um, you clearly on you clear. I mean, you had small victories as you as you move forward, but um, uh, you know, it's 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 a moving target, right? You can always strive for more. Uh, so, yeah. last question, Awit. If you had a billboard in New York in Times Square, what would you put on it that represents who you are, what you believe in, anything, something that people will see going every day? I think I would shorten my father's phrase that started it all and to say, always look out for each other. Right. Hmm. And I think that that's, that's the brand. That's yeah. my life. Yeah. And that was his life. Perfect. All right. So if anybody wants to find you, just type the word Awet, A-W-E-T. You'll find Awet, Walter Gabriel. Um, I, I'm, again, thankful. I know you're busy and you're in the middle of a really busy time for you. I appreciate that we're able to spend time together. Thanks again to my amazing future son-in-law, Kevork. And um, we will stay in touch. And one of these days, I'll do a pop-up in your place and buy Love one it. of these things <laughs> Love it. well thank you so much for your time Seth. i really right. enjoyed it same here thanks a lot great